is administered so that birth certificates are all handled through the WHO. So this whole system is handled internationally. And you live in wards and local government areas, and you live in settlements, you live in unions, and the whole thing percolates up to the top. And when people say to you, oh, you know, UK there is some you know, system of one world government or we don't want one world government. We already live in a one world government. There is no more sovereign nations. That is an illusion that's still maintained. It's settlements. Unions of settlements. And hence the Bank for International Settlements. And the scary thing is, when people say, I didn't know that, they gave us public notice in 1931 when they formed the Bank for International Settlements. And these things have been public notice for years and years and years. Well, let's get back to presumptions. So on the presumptions, we were looking under Roman law, Article 299. Article 299, and we're looking at presumption number seven, the presumption of the Court of Guardians. So let's now go back through the, the presumption of Court of Guardians. The presumption of Court of Guardians is a presumption that as you may be listed as a resident of a ward of a local government area and have listed on your passport the letter P, you're a pauper and therefore under the guardian powers of the government and its agents as a Court of Guardians. Unless this presumption is openly challenged to demonstrate you are both the general guardian and general executor of the matter before the court, the presumption stands and you are by default a pauper and a lunatic and therefore must obey the rules of the clerk of the guardians. And the clerk of the guardians is exactly what the clerk of a magistrate court is. Very important. We're almost through these. The eighth presumption. The presumption of the Court of Trustees is that members of the private bar guild presume you accept the office of trustee as a public servant and government employee just by attending the Roman court as such courts are always for the public trustees by the rules of the guild and the Roman system. So if you front up to a Roman court, again, the presumption is you accept your role as a trustee because it is a court of trustees. Unless this presumption is openly challenged to state you are merely visiting by invitation to clear up the matter and you are not a government employee or public trustee in this instant, the presumption stands and is assumed as one of the most significant reasons to claim jurisdiction, simply because you appeared. Presumption 9. The presumption of government acting in two roles as executor and beneficiary is that for the matter at hand, the private bar guild appoint the judge magistrate in the capacity of executor, while the prosecutor acts in the capacity of beneficiary of the trust for the current matter. Unless this presumption is openly challenged to demonstrate you are both a general guardian and general executor of the matter before the court, the presumption stands and you are by default the trustee and therefore must obey the rules of the executor. Now, it's actually worse than that. So while the information that we have seen in the last few days of those who have gone away, looked at UKD material, come back and seen a way of expressing clearly, we see in the absence of discussing the role of the Guardian, that information is incomplete. And another area that's incomplete is what happens when you do proclaim your role as General Executor. And why does the judge act so quickly to call in the sheriff, the bailiffs. Why are they so immediate on jumping? And that's because of presumption number 10. The presumption of the executor to song taught is a presumption that if the accused does seek to assert their rights as executor and beneficiary over the body, mind and soul, they are acting as an executor to song taught or a false executor challenging the rightful judge as executor. And this is one of the roles. In fact, there is the guardian de son tort, meaning a false guardian, the executor de son tort. And remember, they anticipated these things. They anticipated uh, 
that there would be at some point people waking up. So they built this into the system. So just by simply saying that you are the general executor of your own affairs isn't enough. It's why when you say to a judge, uh, you know, I am the general executor, they rush immediately to say, arrest that man, arrest that woman. Shut them up. If you say another word, you're in contempt. What the judge is doing is the judge is using the presumption of executor to song tort against us to protect their own claim, their own presumption of being executor. Therefore, the judge is assuming the role of true executor and has the right to have you arrested, detained, fined, or forced into some psych evaluation. So unless the presumption is openly challenged by not only asserting one's position as executor, as well as questioning if the judge or magistrate is seeking to act as the executor the song taught. I am the general executor. And I am presuming you are the trustee or you seek to act as executor the song taught. If you make it clear, you make it clear the game's up. The presumption then stands and the judge or magistrate of the private bar guild may seek the assistance of the bailiff or sheriff to assert their false claim. So this is an important one that caps off the reaction. Now we're down to the last two and we'll move on. The presumption of incompetence. Presumption 11. Is a presumption that you are at least ignorant of the law and therefore incompetent to present yourself and argue properly. Therefore, the judge, magistrate, as executor has the right to have you arrested. Now, this is the other aspect of guardianship. Remember, I said that guardianship is your poor and award. Your award because you're considered a lunatic. They presume you're a lunatic. Anyone, they say it. You know, a- anyone that represents themselves is uh, has a full um, as a lawyer. I mean, they, they they make these open presumptions to us of exactly how they think about us. If you pro say, you are clearly demonstrating incompetence. So unless this presumption is openly challenged by the fact you know your position and actively rebuke and object to any contrary presumptions, then it stands by the time of of the pleading coming around that you are incompetent. And the judge and magistrate can do what they want and keep you obedient. Now I'm going to talk about pleading now before we come back to guilt. I'm going to talk about pleading, I'm going to talk about the prosecutor, and then we'll wrap up with the last one there, the presumption of guilt. So let's talk about pleading, because this is another area where we have done a lot of work and become much, much clearer on exactly what we mean. So let's talk about Plea. Before we talk about plea, let's go 283 jurisdiction and then we'll go to uh, plea. So I'm now looking at Article 283 jurisdiction. I want to cover a couple of things on jurisdiction and then we talk about plea. So we say jurisdiction in Canon 3110 of Article 283, we mean Jurisdiction being the authority, claim rights and powers of one or more officials to review, administer and issue certain decrees, prescripts, statutes, ordinances for a given juridic person or society. And jurisdiction is most frequently applied to the authority of a court to hear and adjudicate a matter, particularly in the the valid publication of ordinances. If I go to Canon 3115, and we covered this last week, but it's important. In the personal jurisdiction, in the territorial jurisdiction, in subject matter jurisdiction, you see now the presumptions that they're making. Each of those presumptions are claimed right through a claimed law. So personal jurisdiction, the claim is jus in rem, and the claim law is lex citus, law of the place. So right of property is what personal jurisdiction is all about. Territorial jurisdiction, we see the right right is jus gentium, good old international law, which covers the whole area of guardianship and executor and trust law. And we see lex loci, law of the place, being the law. And subject matter jurisdiction, we see jus in personam, which is you've, you've come to court, you've consented, your mind is consented, and lex specialis, 
which is just another fancy way of saying legal realism is in place. So let's have a look at plea. Again, all by presumptions. Article 288, plea, before we go back and look at the uh, final section of uh, the 12 presumptions. So under plea, Canon 3154, a plea is a formal prayer demanded within the Roman courts of the private bar guilds in answer to a claim of controversy that formally establishes the acknowledgement of the accused that jurisdiction has been perfected and the manner of law and procedure by which the accused requests the matter to be reviewed. I mean, that's a lot of words. But the key understanding is that a plea is a prayer. Now, let's move down, right down to uh, 3156. In the absence of a valid plea, a matter cannot proceed nor judgment be rendered. Now, what they did was they, in fact, corrupted an ancient Roman concept of plain or plenus and, re and replaced it with the word plea from pleiades, the seven sisters being an acronym for the seven hills of ancient Rome and, of course, seven spirits, uh, holy spirits. So they, they corrupted it. Now, what we say is in 3158, by definition, the entering of any kind of plea is tacit consent of the jurisdiction of the Roman court. Therefore, a member of one heaven, of which you are all members, or associate society, has only one legitimate reply to a Roman court and demand to plea in the formal response of demurra, which we covered last week. And they say, how do you plea? There is only one way to answer that in their court. If they've ignored everything else, and I hope they haven't ignored everything else, but if they have, there's only one way to respond, and that is demurra. And demurra, as we know, is, is to cease until jurisdiction is proved. A request time to prepare a written motion against the legal sufficiency uh, or the complaint in suit. So I just want to deviate there so we understood what we meant by plea. You never plea in a Roman court. You never plea because as a member of one heaven, you are contradicting your oath as a trustee. Your oath in one heaven means you should never plea in a Roman court. You have one answer and one answer only, that is demurra. I'm now going to return to the final uh, presumption under Roman court and then we'll wrap up because we're on the hour. So I'm going back to Article 299 to finish off the 12 presumptions of Roman court. So the 12th presumption is the presumption of guilt. The presumption of guilt is a presumption that as it is presumed to be a private business meeting of the Bar Guild, you are guilty. Whether you plead guilty, do not plead, or plead not guilty. Therefore, unless you have either uh, prepared an affidavit of truth and a motion to dismiss with extreme prejudice onto the public record or have called a demurrer, so you only have two choices. You either put it in, or in fact you have three. You put in your affidavit of truth and motion to dismiss prior to entering in and hand a copy to the clerk, hand a copy to the prosecutor, and you plead a demurrer. If you haven't done that, then the presumption of guilt stands. If there is guilt, then the private bar guild will hold you until that guilt is paid. Or they will bail you, a surety, until the guilt is paid. That's the final 12th presumption. Now, I mentioned just before, when I said uh, the trustee oath, um, in light of what we're doing, I, I, would, I would argue that we should, in fact, update that and call that the executor oath, so it's clear. Remember, there are three trusts that are granted under one heaven. A divine trust, which relates to your spirit. The true trust, which relates to your flesh. And superior trust, which relates to your engagement in commerce and association 
by being a member of different